just been reminded that on the uh, 30th of Jan was the first gathering for the selection to go with. So it's our culmination of the year. We've been about just under a week in rowing in. To use class, you never know what the Atlantic is going to throw at you. The first call uh, that we got when we were crashed out to go on our first real, real patrol, flown into a huge cache of um, material, you know, explosives, and we destroyed them in place. Big bang, you know, extracted from there, you know, with with no injuries, got everybody back out and safely back to Camp Bastion. And you know, it was that sort of success that you know brought us all together, closer as a as a team, as a, as a troop. Walking around in, in Afghan is a, is a strange, really strange feeling because you, you know that these IEDs and mines and things are in the ground and you, you can't really see them. We do a lot of training beforehand to you know, assess ground sign and things like that and make sure that we are as well trained as we can be to, to spot these things. But you know that there are going to be instances where you just can't and you just can't see them. I try not to let emotion sort of dictate how you respond and react to things. I think that's not the way to, to do it at all. I think, you know, it's a, it's a terrifying environment to be in completely, but you can't let that get the better of you, even that's how we reacted to the, to the situation. Is everyone all right? Oh, that's a double amputee. In the end, I did, I did initiate one of these devices, and, um, you know, you find yourself in the, in the situation that you never wanted to be in, but this was something that I signed up to do. Right, you're going to deal with me. Yeah. You go with that, then you just have to deal with the consequences. How much rations can we pack right. down there? Right. Let's go. Stop yes. I think I think that's the last of the um, the snack pack boxes. The responsibility of of being skipper was handed to me. I had so many sleepless nights before this race started. I really genuinely did. I would wake up thinking, oh, I, I need to get this, or I need to get that, or I really hope these guys are okay. What happens if I need to call in a medevac? What happens if I need to call in a tanker to come pick one of these guys up? The whole way across, that was just always going through your mind. You know, you really do feel that the responsibility for, for the crew, but also for the success of the, the whole sort of event. There's somebody that's got to take a lead. We've got a guy already across the Atlantic before. Humour, I think, is, a, is vitally important. We're going to have to have bucket loads of that. Month to go. Seasickness, the routine, getting on well with each other is, is just a, a critical factor. And I don't, for a shadow of a doubt, believe that it's going to be an easy task. But we spent very little time in the boat you know. So going out to Agamera is, uh, you know, a couple of weeks early is, is, is important, I guess. You know, so. Certainly for us. <laughs> this is now my new family for the next uh, next few months. A bit tired. I'll be fine. I'll be fine. I'll be alright. <laughs> be good. I'll be good. Just, just want to get on it now and get 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 it over with. <laughs> Pretty much. I was injured uh, on a parachute jump into a football stadium. Um, it was a, a planned demonstration that didn't go to plan. And my life changed from, from that point onwards. And the loss of my left leg above the knee was just a, a small part of my injuries. I'm 15 years down the line post-trauma. Post um, uh, eventually I was um, uh, filtered out the armed forces system. It's been explained to me um, that you know we're going to be riding some serious stuff, you know, and uh, you know that might not even you know it'd be possible to row it. You know, and it's batting down the hatches and just ride it out maybe for a couple of days. You know.
So we are currently waiting for the Raymarine boys to come back. We've got our nav systems being updated at the moment. Our AIS isn't talking to the chart plotter inside. Uh, it's alarming outside, so we are visible to vessels and we know that they're coming. Uh, unfortunately, we just aren't having any details displayed, so we wouldn't be able to hail them if we needed to try and avoid a collision at sea. We'll then be able to go out and do some, uh, some training rows, uh, get the guys some decent water time, make sure that they're happy with their seats and, and all that sort of stuff. We've been here for nine days and we haven't even been out of the harbour yet. The first opportunity that we had to row this boat uh, as a crew uh, turned out to be a night row, which was, you know, uh, challenging and exciting for them, I think. That was quite cool. Um, yeah, you know, we, we pushed out of the harbour. It was just pleasant, actually, uh, nice and cool. Well, some of us got to sleep for a little while, first time we'd slept, slept on the boat. Um, I think we were out for about eight hours. I guess, um, you know, during the day you can handle a, a few issues on board a little bit easier just because it's daylight, but no, first row, um, we needed to get some night hours in, that was, that was the prerequisite for the race organisers. You have all seen the weather forecast and so therefore it shouldn't be a big surprise that we are delaying the Telescope Whiskey Atlantic Challenge 2050. From Sunday next week, that. from a week from now. <laughs> All rowers have to be ready to race from Friday evening. I thought Friday was looking like a good option, but they think that it looks more like Sunday. So, you know, we've got another full week here, realistically. We need to be ready to go uh, by Friday night. Um, with the hope that we can get going, you know, as soon as possible, really. But it sounds like we're going to have some pretty serious wind uh, as soon as we get out of here. So they're talking sort of 20 to 25 knots. So we'll be expecting pretty big seas from the, from the start. So it's going to be a baptism of fire for the guys that haven't been out before. Atlantic campaigns, Atlantic campaigns. This is Invictus, Invictus over. Invictus is in our We are heading out for our three hour journey row. Understood. Out. So we're just going over all the kit and equipment again and repacking everything. Just want to head off now and uh. Yeah, just head out to the open water and start rowing. I said my goodbyes to in the UK, which was probably easier. It's not thinking about your family when you're out here as such, and yeah, it's, bad, it's better that way. My, my dog was the worst. It was like he knew I was going. Come here. There's a lot of features in the terrain here. It is quite similar to Hellman, strangely enough. It's quite flat, tree lines and irrigation ditches. I think gold we're missing is 40 degrees heat, really. And it was the night of the 30th of November. We had pushed forward to uh, clear some compounds. I stepped in an IED and it initiated, and I lost my right leg below my knee during the blast. Easily about 15 to 16 guys walked over that before me, like, and um, I and I also walked over it beforehand as well. It's a bit unusual for somebody from the Republic to join the British Army. I joined to be a soldier, I joined to have a career, and I've not been home for years now. I know I'm an injured soldier, but I don't really want to be an injured soldier anyway. I just, not that I want my leg back as such, but he's a hero. I don't, I don't see myself as a hero. You on, mate? Yeah, I'm on, yeah. I decided to bring the guys up to Casa Colón, which is where Christopher Columbus stayed before he headed out in his mad adventure across the Atlantic Ocean um, for the first time. The earth was still flat back in those days as far as everybody was concerned. So head across to here. We're here to do something very similar. We, we're bringing a bunch of guys that have never been across an ocean or on the sea in some cases before and I'm sure the same sort of nerves that the guys were feeling back in those days will be you know, coursing through our veins too. 
I've done three tours of Afghanistan and uh, a tour of Iraq. But I, I, I was injured on a roadside accident. I stopped uh, at a scene of an accident um, when another car crashed into the car that had crashed, first of all, with such force and speed that the uh, engine and gearbox come flying out and uh, hit me. And um, it took my right leg off and completely dislocated uh, my left uh, leg at my knee. Uh, and I was getting quite panicked and I, uh, a Rastafarian guy called Frank Sabindi, he came up and he said, what can I do? And I was like, I need a tourniquet now on my leg. And he helped me and he's thought I've got to stand on my femoral artery. And uh, without them, I would have died. I'm taking a Rastafarian across with me. <laughs> so I think he'll quite like that. We've entered the boat, we've put stuff back in the boat, we've taken it out of the boat and we've put it back in the boat. Um, yeah, still bits of work to do on it, there's things that aren't quite right. Uh, we've obviously been double checking this, double checking that, we've managed to get out in the water, we've done, a, we've done at least eight, possibly ten hours night rowing. Um, obviously there's a few things that um, we do need to sort out. Um, there's only about uh, there's only three days left, uh, the weekend and Monday, to finish our preparations. Like the, the, the whole process, going through the selection, to get in here, to getting the boat in the water, to getting the boat ready. But I've got a vague idea that, you know, perhaps very soon I'm going to be sat in a rowing boat going across. Sunday, 20th at 8.45, official restart for the Tusker Whiskey Atlantic Challenge. And I've no idea why, but that's when it started to become real to me. And um, I don't mind admitting that I'm quite nervous about the whole thing. I don't know how I'm going to react. It's, uh, it's definitely getting real. I can see the race start, I can understand it, I can almost you know, feel how real it is now. Yeah, I'm very nervous. We'll be, we'll be ready, that's for sure. We, we, we'll, we'll make our way down to the quayside and because there's been a delay, we want to get going now, you know, so. Uh, obviously, um, we will have continued thoughts of our families at home, you know, We've said, you know, what do we do if logistically if somebody's father died, if your mother, et cetera, et cetera. You know, those things are, are you know, out of our control. Okay. My dad's quite poorly at the moment. Um, it was his birthday on Monday, um, so I sent him a nice message. Other than my immediate family, I really don't really want to know anything, to be quite frank. I can't control anything. The race start is going to be a, an early, early morning. There'll be a lot of nerves. I'm hugely excited but absolutely terrified of it at the same time because it's a big bad world out there. That ocean is angry <laughs> a lot of the time. Stay safe. Everything is for, the, for good. Everything is for good. Whatever, whatever happens. It's quite weird actually taking legs off for the last time and hopping on board and this will be it for the next 50 odd days. You know, it's just a, it's a strange feeling to... Early night, early night, so yeah, yeah, we're ready for it now. Can we go now? Did you get a full night's sleep? Nice. No, I think the nerves come from the enormity of what's about to happen.
two or three days into leaving like a mayor, um, pretty seasick. The story could have been a bit different. Your father's pretty poorly, it suggests you get home now. We were rowing for the message, apart from our own experiences, you know, good, bad, indifferent. The message was strong. I think it was the first or second night. I um, can't remember which one it was, but I had a, uh, I'd almost describe it as a panic attack, actually, um, where I got the 10 minutes to go. It was really hard. I'd summon up all of my moral courage to get out of that hatch and get on the oars. Um, being out there in the waves was, was scary, so I've never experienced anything like that before. It was almost like a hurdle. Because once I got out of the hatch and started rowing, I kind of knew then that I could do it. So it's the beginning of day five, and our auto helm has packed in already. As you can hear in the background, so the garden auto helm, we are pretty stuffed. We have to get a hand steering, um, which would mean that only one person would be rowing at a time, which for us isn't really an option if we want to maintain any kind of boat speed. We have to have two people on the oars all the time. So if this auto helm doesn't work, we are in serious trouble. Um, um, so what's really happened then? I suppose the most significant thing is the. Um, Three of us got away, three um, boats got away from um, a storm that had formed because we headed south, everybody else is on power anchor and then today significantly we've pointed the boat towards Antigua so we stopped going south and now we're going west and it just feels like um, starting to think dream that it might be possible that we could win. So, it's a uh, merry merry Christmas and all of that good stuff. How do I feel about Christmas Day? Um, just really another day. It's all worth it. This morning, me and Cal watched the moon set. It was a full moon and it set just before the sun rose. Genuinely think it's one of those moments that will live with me for the rest of my life. It was just so hauntingly beautiful. It's New Year's. We uh, just had a bit of a Happy New Year on deck. Swig of whiskey to mark the occasion. Strange being at sea, and then everybody's back home having a bit of a party. But, but great at the same time, it's a beautiful evening. It's been a, it's been a good day, we've made some good progress. Missing my family more than what I thought I'd ever would, ever have. Missing my family more than when I've been in that worst places, more dangerous and isolated and horrible places. I've just nearly gone overboard. It's hard to move around the boat with prosthetic legs. Legs getting tangled in lines and ropes. You can't feel it as you move through the boat, so... Just getting from here to there. So it's, what's that, three metres? In a tiny boat rolling sea, and I'm not steady on my feet. I just sort of like tumbled over the side. I went down the uh, far end to have, have a poo. Broke a leg, broke um, one of these, pop. But luckily, I bought a spare one. Uh, 
into our third week, but we're tired, very tired. I am shagged, but everybody's chipping in, that's for sure. Um, a bit fractious at times, that's understandable. People are very, very tired, you know, we've been doing this routine now for nearly three weeks. Thinking a lot about my family at the moment. Still surrounded by water. It feels weird because the horizon is like a big circle around you for like five miles and it's, it's almost as if you're in the middle all the time and you're not going anywhere. Unfortunately snapped an AIS antenna the other day, so that's our automatic identification system. La Capella Invictus, can you see us on your radar? Over. We're on constant watch for the ships to make sure that we're not going to get run down by anybody. We are an ocean growing vessel and we are restricted in our ability to manoeuvre. Over. Uh, La Capella, we were just making sure that you could see us on your radar as we are quite a small vessel. 5.35 miles, over. Yeah, La Capella, that is correct, thank you. Um, seas are pumping, pushing us in the right direction. The food though, oh, man. The other thing I was going to say, we've uh, been learning stuff. Well, me and Cal do, we uh, row together. And uh, during the night shift, the three hours on, and we barked on learning and books. Us. You had these towels that you laid on, and also a towel that you'd wash. Uh, that you dry yourself down with and I kind of rotated them and they just got full of pseudocreme and they were just wet and salty and just horrible. I managed to get somewhere washed, uh, washed out. Would have done it every day if we could but fresh water is precious and it takes a lot of uh, battery power, a lot of energy to make fresh water. Nineteenth of January today, we've seen a whale today. It circled the boat a lot. It was quite curious of what we were and what we were doing. Seeing the whales was amazing. Um, I wished I'd just jumped in. Yeah, it circled the boat about eight times and then just went off. trying to outrun a storm which is sitting off the coast of uh, North America stroke the Caribbean um, which is due to push out into the mid-Atlantic and all crews have been advised to head south. We've not managed to outrun the storm, it's going to hit us about 12 o'clock today apparently. So well played Poseidon, well played. It was over halfway as well. Um, just over halfway. It got to the point where Lee and I couldn't actually do the changeover, so Patrick was on deck, he was getting the power anchor and all of the equipment out and ready. Myself and Lee rode until um, it was physically impossible to row anymore. We were at the point of absolute exhaustion. deploy the paranchor. It sits about 70 metres away from the boat and what that does is just creates loads of drag and it just slows you from going in the wrong direction essentially. Just got some stack packs down here because apparently we'll be locked in this cabin, me and Kale, for uh, three days apparently. You lock yourself in your cabins and that's it, you won't ride it out. Both lying naked next to each other. I'm just going to put my walk through. So I'm not going to go out on the deck. I can't stand this. It was too hot as well. 
you, you really do get shaken around quite a lot in there. Uh, you tend to find yourself propping an elbow into something and a hand against something else to just try and you know, stop yourself from being thrown side to side all the time. <laughs> It's great to see that sort of the violent nature of the ocean and to see these huge big rollers coming through and you know just the wind in your face and the salt spray and you know it's so it's so exciting, it really is. Two days we've been on Paranak now. The weather's calmed down a fair bit. Um, still wind coming from completely the wrong direction, about 15 to 18 knots. So forward progress is impossible really. Um, I think in the last sort of 48 hours we drifted back about 19 miles. It, it had calmed down enough to be able to stand out on deck, get the fishing kit all built up. Because uh, I'd seen a Dorado flash past the, the sort of um, the back of the boat. Really, really beautiful fish. Everybody got on deck, everybody was hooting and screaming and the fish were jumping out of the air and it was just like, you know, crazy excitement compared to what we were used to, you know, this like sitting monotonous drag row, two hours on, two hours off. They, they went back home and they, they lived to see another day. Ah, oh, it's gone. He slipped it. I really hope we do get off and can get going by, uh, by tomorrow. This is boring, really, really boring. We've done a bit of boat cleaning today um, with uh, Kale and Lee on watch. They decided to go over and have a bit of swim. If you let go of the boat, you, you'd go, you'd drift. So you, you had to keep like, hand lights on just in case. Right, shall we have a look at this dagger, Paul? Twice we scraped the barnacles off the bottom of the boat. We, we gained at least half a knot. Really, really felt the difference once we're done. I jumped in and I just, I wanted to, I don't know, I was just kind of in my own head. I was like, I'm going to put the boot to my back and I'm going to just look straight ahead of me and look to the left and right. But I just wanted to know what it felt like if I went overboard and there was nothing else around. Oh, right. That's enough, right? I really, really, really loved getting in the water. It was amazing just to look down through that blueness and just know there's nothing for three miles down, it's amazing. This camera, the, uh, the um, no, the uh, video diary one, well, it flashes red and then goes green, yeah? Finding it quite therapeutic to talk to an inanimate object, really. A lot of time to think about stuff out here, which is quite good. I'm enjoying that. I'm enjoying having, having the time to think about everything. I'm missing my family. That is really. I didn't think. I didn't think it would affect me that much, to, to be honest. I've been away on tour before, obviously to Iraq and Afghan. It's bizarre, really. You don't really think think of those until until it happens. Where Where do you go after growing an ocean? You're two hours on, two hours off routine, and then three hours at night. My day was taken up with trying to catch up with sleep. Sleep deprivation is funny. Like, I still keep hearing voices. I'm always hearing voices at night now. I, I had two, about two or three incidents where I, where I woke up to come on shift when it wasn't my turn. I, I had a problem. I, I kept waking up and hearing in my sleep 10 minutes and getting ready and shouting to Nige, Nige, get ready. In one two hour period, he tried to get out three times before it was his time to come out. <laughs> and instead of going, oh, I've, got, I've still got time off, I used to get quite upset with myself because you're missing out on time to sleep. It's hard to imagine the, the, the row in its entirety. In my head, it's still broken down into those two hour segments, those two hours rowing, and then two hours off fighting to try and get that sleep in that you, you know you need. Morning, have a look at that. Bye. 
morning. Good morning. We reckon we're about 13, 12, 13 days out. It's getting hard now. It's really, really hard, difficult. Uh, you, you just pray that it, it, it's going to, it's going to sit well uh, with everybody, and uh, um, and it didn't at times. We reckon we're less than two weeks out from Antigua. It's been a while since I've done this video of diary stuff. It's quite a quite a claustrophobic environment. I don't know if I really want to talk about it to be honest, but it's been bloody tough, there's no doubt about that. Um, I don't think I'm going to do many more video diaries after this. I'm not sure if I've signed up. Being in such a small environment, a cramped environment with three other blokes is, yeah, it exacerbates everything. I was just, you know, wishing to get the event over at that stage, you know. Um, the auto helm became a massive part of our life and you could hear it whirring and really working, and you're like, oh no. Two auto helms broken now, one back, a lot of morale. We're down to one auto helm, we still had, you know, a thousand miles to go. Um, and there was no ways that, at that stage, we believed that the third auto helm was gonna make it across. The great thing about an auto helm is that it means that you don't have to rely on either hand or foot steering. It's driven by a mapping system on board. It essentially steers the boat into the direction that you want the boat to go. In the rougher weather, we would go to hand steering, which is quite frustrating because you can't get the changeovers. And um, you know, trying to, trying to do a changeover with Lee or Patrick or whoever it was was nearly impossible. It doesn't take much to set the boat off course. And that is when you're most likely to capsize and you know, people get washed overboard and those sorts of things. When the auto helm goes, it means you've got one person has to sit and steer hand steer while the other person rows. It's so mentally draining, it really is. Right, okay, we need to do something. I would just hand steer for the night kind of thing um, and hoped that the weather would be better in the morning. One three hour, or is it two hour uh, stint at night, power steer, hand steering. Remember looking at the compass and thinking, I can't see anything. I can't see any numbers or anything. Is that tired? I sat on, on the hand steering for 10 hours, head torch on with red light on it, and you literally are just staring at the compass. You're not looking at anything else, and you're just pulling these steering lines, trying to drive the boat in a fairly sensible direction. Um, probably one of the most grim experiences of my entire life, I'd say. It's, it, it's truly awful. So it looks like we're going to have to try and forge something. I've got the two previously bust up ones out and trying to repair them. Hopefully between the three of them we'll get something to work out. You can hear the other auto helm screaming in the background as well, so I don't think it's going to last much longer. So it's quite important that we get this done as soon as possible. We yeah. might, I think we might be in. Yeah? yeah? That was what it was like before. Yeah. I think it might be working. The guy that rode across the Atlantic the first time from east to west and west to east, on his final leg of his journey, he landed on the island I'm from, and his name was Don Allen. And um, every time I used to look at the picture as I was growing up, I thought one day it'd be quite a cool thing to do was row that. Hello. There's a risk of injury for every crew that do it. There's not necessarily 
just because we're amputees, it doesn't mean we're more at risk. It's just just a, just the nature of what you were doing. I will, I will. Cheers, thank you. Uh, oh, that was a race doctor. I got a, a back injury during the row. On three fingers, I've lost down to the first joint. Still, like my hands a wee bit numb and all that, but it's it's, it's grand. Got a lot more respect for uh, Don Allen now. We are so close to 61 degrees now. At the 61 degree point, we will have officially crossed the Atlantic Ocean. Three, two, one. And look what we've done! <laughs> 44 miles away from Antigua after that. How many? 44. That. You know, we came across the, the glow of Antigua on the horizon before we saw Antigua. It was night time when we eventually, you know, were within range of her. We're inside of land! Dry land! Barring some absolute tragedy, this should hopefully be our last night at sea. So if everybody's, you know, slightly, you know, boisterous almost, you kind of like, Yes, this is awesome, let's get on it, let's, let's pull hard, let's get in. I've spent my life a very physical person, and then a large part of your physicality is suddenly taken away. You've, you've got to reassess who you are. These expeditions reaffirm, I can be that person and some more, with one leg, with one arm with, you know, no legs. That gives us um, a chance to, to re-establish who we are and where we fit in. We had this really light headwind start to blow and we're thinking, where's, where's that coming from? That's, that's unusual. It's quite disheartening thinking that we've just come all this way and now we're being smashed by this storm. It got stronger and stronger and it sort of built through the afternoon into the evening. Um, the conditions are pretty um, rubbish. We have had an absolutely disgusting night of massive squalls. So they weren't squalls, they were like mini storms. And at one point, Cal was really, first time I see him, really worried. Now Nigel's at elbow, still giving him grief. He can't row with two oars, which is frustrating. I hit me elbow on the Rolox quite a lot. Uh, cabin door. I was rowing with one arm at that stage and struggling. Lee's now been on the oars for seven and a half hours so far. Then that was a fair call, and, uh, and that was Unbeknown to me, that storm was the night my father passed away, and that was, you know, uh, you know, maybe he was wishing us all home. Um, we advised the local coast guard that we're coming in. At one point, they weren't sure if they were going to have to rescue us because of the squalls and because we're getting blasted south so far. I have visualised um, arriving, about the feelings that that you'll have. Um, and, and the depth and the scope and the feelings of, of first sighting land and seeing it and, and being able to aim the boat for where you're going to finish and then seeing your, your family and, um, and your friends and, and the reception. So you have this like sensory deprivation that's just gone on for, for like 46 days when I've seen anything. Well, you can see the sort of green gem of Antigua just on the horizon and oh man it's just the most amazing feeling rowing down the coastline of it and then all the boats and everything start to come out to join you. Rowing into English Harbour it just it was overwhelming, overwhelming. I thought I'd get emotions. It was just 
It was too overwhelming. Out of the night that covers me, black as the pit from pole to pole. I thank whatever gods may be for my unconquerable soul. In the fell clutch of circumstance, I have not winced nor cried aloud. Under the bludgeonings of chance, my head is bloody but unbowed. Beyond this place of wrath and tears looms but the horror of the shade. And yet the menace of the years finds and shall find me unafraid. It matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishments the scroll. I am the master of my, my fate. fate. I, I am, am the captain, captain of my soul. soul. This is where I grew up. In memory of my dad, they still have his boat outside the pub. Yeah, it's, it's taken me back to being a kid again. Met a lot of old friends and that, people I've grown up with what, since I've been here, and, and they said they've been watching it on Facebook. I can't describe the relief of rowing into English Harbour. Four years ago, I was lying in a hospital bed, and I, I genuinely thought that it was the end of my adventuring days. Um, I, I didn't want to give up, I didn't want to stop, but I didn't think that I'd be invited along on these sorts of things. You know, too much of a liability. My life was defined by service, and, and that was worthwhile. That meant something to me. I think since I've come back from the row, I can look back on it, and that's been nothing but a positive experience. It really has. It is different to, to how I was before. Um, things are done differently, I shower differently, get around differently, move slower than I used to. But this has become the new normal. And there's nothing you can do about it. There isn't. There's nothing you can do about it. So all that you can do is just get up and get on with it. We can do some pretty awesome stuff, so let's get out and get motivated and go and do some cool... Let's go do some cool things, you know? <laughs> Was it worth it? Yeah, yeah, it definitely was. Thank you.